You probably know that all stuff is made up of atoms, and that an atom is a really, 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 really tiny particle. Every atom has a core, which is made up of at least one positively charged particle called a proton. And in most cases, some number of neutral particles called neutrons. That core is surrounded by negatively charged particles called electrons. The identity of an atom is determined only by the number of protons in its nucleus. Hydrogen is hydrogen because it has just one proton. Carbon is carbon because it has six. Gold is gold because it has 79, and so on. Indulge me in a momentary tangent. How do we know about atomic structure? We can't see protons, neutrons, or electrons. So we do a bunch of experiments and develop a model for what we think is there. Then we do some more experiments and see if they agree with the model. If they do, great. If they don't, it might be time for a new model. We've had lots of very different models for atoms since Democritus in 400 BC, and there will almost certainly be many more to come. Okay, tangent over. The cores of atoms tend to stick together, but electrons are free to move. And this is why chemists love electrons. If we could marry them, we probably would. But electrons are weird. They appear to behave either as particles, like little baseballs, or as waves, like water waves, depending on the experiment that we perform. One of the weirdest things about electrons is that we can't exactly say where they are. It's not that we don't have the equipment, it's that this uncertainty is part of our model of the electron. So we can't pinpoint them. Fine. But we can say there's a certain probability of finding an electron in a given space around the nucleus. And that means that we can ask the following question. If we drew a shape around the nucleus such that we would be 95% sure of finding a given electron within that shape, what would it look like? Here are a few of these shapes. Chemists call them orbitals, and what each one looks like depends on, among other things, how much energy it has. The more energy an orbital has, the farther most of its density is from the nucleus. By the way, why did we pick 95% and not 100%? Well, that's another quirk of our model of the electron. Past a certain distance from the nucleus, the probability of finding an electron starts to decrease, more or less exponentially. Which means that while it will approach zero, it'll never actually hit zero. So in every atom, there is some small, but non-zero, probability that for a very, very short period of time, one of its electrons is at the other end of the known universe. But mostly, electrons stay close to their nucleus, as clouds of negative charge density that shift and move with time. How electrons from one atom interact with electrons from another determines almost everything. Atoms can give up their electrons, surrendering them to other atoms, or they can share electrons. And the dynamics of this social network are what make chemistry interesting. From plain old rocks to the beautiful complexity of life, the nature of everything we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and even feel is determined at the atomic level. So let's dig a little deeper about electrons. Electrons are the negatively charged subatomic particle. The mass of an electron is so much smaller than that of a proton and a neutron. Protons and neutrons are pretty much equal, and their uh, mass is equal to the mass number for any element on the periodic table. Then we have electrons that you can see there um, 1,830 electrons to one proton, so their mass is much smaller. And then a neutral atom is one in which the number of electrons is going to equal the number of protons, and their charges balance. So here you can see two protons with positive charge, two electrons with a negative charge, and their charges would balance. Only the electrons are the structures of an atom that will be involved in chemical bonds. So knowing how they place in the electron cloud into what are called electron shells will tell us how they can bond with other atoms. So electrons are located in cloud but they're organized in what are called shells. And here we see 
the formation of three shells. There can be four or five, but for our discussion we're going to stick with the uh, three shells. And the shells can hold up to a particular number of electrons. So you can see here that the uh, sec first shell or the inner shell can hold up to two. The second shell can hold up to eight. And the third shell can hold up to 18. But for our purposes, we're going to identify the third shell as holding eight as well. It'll just be a quick way for us to figure out where the electrons are placed into that shell. So here you can see the first 18 elements with their electron shell diagrams. These are called Bohr diagrams and they identify the placement of electrons in the first, second, and third shells. And again, so the number of electrons will tell us where those electrons get placed. So if we take carbon here in the center of the figure, we know that carbon has six electrons. So if that's true, and it is, then the first two electrons would get placed into the first shell, and the remaining four would distribute into the second shell. The second shell can hold up to eight, and if we go all the way down to neon here, which has 10 electrons, then we'll see that second shell holding up to eight. The first shell holds two, the second shell holds eight. So when we place electrons into those shells, there are two rules that we have to follow. The first shell can hold up to two electrons, and that's its limit. So here we can see four examples. These are the big four. And that first shell is only holding up to two electrons. The second rule is that the outermost shell, for our purposes, the second and third shell, is going to hold up to eight. And so we can see that here too. Here's oxygen and it's going to have eight electrons. The first two go into the first shell and then the remaining six distribute into the second shell. Notice the open spaces here in these electron shell diagrams. We see a solid dot and a open dot. The solid dot represents an actual electron. The open dot is trying to show you a place where a, an electron could reside, but for this particular atom there isn't an, an electron for it because it doesn't have that many. So let's see if we can figure out the placement of the electrons into the electron shells for our big four. You have to know the atomic number and if we know the atomic number, then we know the number of electrons. And then we have to follow the two rules. Right? The first shell gets two electrons only. That's as many as it can hold. And the second shell can hold up to eight. So let's take a look at hydrogen. Hydrogen right, has one electron because its atomic number is one. So that first electron and its only electron goes into that first shell. There are no other electrons, so there wouldn't be any in the second shell, but there would be an available space for an electron because it can hold up to two in that first shell. Let's take a look at carbon. Carbon has uh, six electrons because the atomic number is six, so the first two go into the first shell because it can hold up to two and the remaining four go into the second shell. But that second shell again can hold up to eight, so there are four potential spots for an electron to be held in carbon's outer shell. Nitrogen has an atomic number of seven, so it can hold two electrons in the first shell, five electrons in the second, and that means there's an available space for three electrons in the outer shell. So now let's take oxygen. Oxygen has a atomic number of eight, so it has eight electrons. The first two electrons go into the first shell. The remaining six go into the second, and that means that its outer shell can hold uh, another two potential electrons. 
So what is that outer shell? We call that outer shell something specific. It's referred to as the valence shell. So the valence shell represents the outer shell of any atom. And we talk about the, val the number of valence shell electrons as well as the number of valence shell electrons needed to complete that outer shell. And that's important for bonding. So if we arrange this table now into what's referred to as the Honk rule for electron distribution in the order of the number of electrons needed to fill the outer shell, that's a good rule for allowing us to know how many bonds can go to any of those individual atoms. So for hydrogen, there's going to be one bond. For oxygen, it's two. For nitrogen, it's three. And carbon, it's four. So knowing the Hank rule, that's right, the Hank rule, will be helpful to you as you begin to start building molecules.